Making documentaries around the world, I've witnessed poverty in many countries. But one film I thought I'd never make is a film about poverty on my own doorstep. And this was your home for how long? Six months. Six months? Yeah. Today, one in five people in Britain live in poverty. Last night, an estimated 4,000 people slept rough in the UK. 80% of those either have mental health issues or drug or alcohol addiction. How much are you drinking then? Two to two and a half litres of vodka a day. Two to two and a half litres. Yep. And one in three have spent time in prison. I've only ever lived on the streets, in prison or in hostels. Last year, over £100 billion was spent on welfare. That's one sixth of the government's entire budget. What's, what's in this? What is this here? That's, that's allowed to put chips in. Yeah, OK, you got that there to put your chips in. Right. I want to know why poverty still exists in 21st century Britain. After an extensive regeneration project, Glasgow is once again a thriving metropolis, attracting international tourism, and has just won the bid to host the Commonwealth Games in 2014. I've come to Glasgow not only because it epitomises the issues which are trapping millions of people in a cycle of poverty across the UK, but also because the city is pioneering initiatives to break that cycle. Certain parts of the city have a 68% unemployment rate. Drug addiction rates are some of the highest in Europe, and life expectancy for some is as low as 54 years. With the economic downturn and cuts to benefits, more people are falling into poverty. Today, there are over 10,000 homeless people in Glasgow. Salt and Light is a Christian outreach charity that supports Glasgow's neediest. Their bus serves as a mobile community center during the day and a soup kitchen for the homeless two nights a week. Ann Wallace founded Salt and Light 11 years ago. That bridge has a particular significance for you, doesn't it? Sentimental. I used to sleep under it. We have about 30 other people. 30 other people? Yeah. Has it changed much? No, it's not changed at all. It's amazing what you can do with sheets of cardboard and newspapers to keep you warm. We didn't even have sleeping bags. We all kept each other warm. So what were the series of events that caused you to be out on the streets? When I was 13, I was raped, and that's when I started drinking really badly. I could never keep my mouth shut with my dad, and I always fronted up to him. He was always really intimidating. Was he violent towards you? Oh, aye. Uh -huh. To us, it was sexual, physical, emotional. But I had a good eight years of counselling that saved my life. It must have been very hard for you then. It, it was the loneliness more than anything. On my birthday, I tried to end my life and it was vodka. Three bottles of vodka. Three bottles of vodka? Three bottles of vodka and still I never died. God was definitely looking after me and it was almost as though it was like training. Now that I look back in it, it was almost like I've been there, I've done it. I've took part in it and now the people I'm working with are there at the moment and I can really empathise with them. I mean, there's folk at that, that bus the night and I'll look at them and I'll know how lonely they are. But I can put my arms around them, Ross, and I might be the only human contact that that person's got for last Thursday to this Thursday. There will be thousands and thousands of young people mm -hmm. and old people yep. and middle-aged people from all sorts of backgrounds Hi. tonight who have nowhere to sleep yep. and no food in their stomach. That's right. In the UK in 2012. What a disgrace. An absolute disgrace. I'm going to meet one of Salt and Light's regulars who served with the British Army for six years. Dave is one of Britain's many homeless. How 
How important is salt and light? How important? Yeah. If, it, if it weren't for them, I'd go hungry. Really? Honestly. How did you get involved in the drug team? It's hard to say. It was one of these ones where you just forget about the flashbacks. Are you talking about flashbacks of what? Sorry. I'm... Well, I've now been diagnosed as PTSD. Yeah. So, when Which... I do stuff like that, it's just... you forget. What did you serve when you were in the army? The foot skins. Yeah, and where did you go? Bosnia. Bosnia, you're in Bosnia, yeah? Two tours of Bosnia, that was enough for me. I mean, you're saying that you're drinking and you're taking drugs to kind of, like, cut out the problems The drugs in a major issue. It's a drink. The drink. How much are you drinking, then? Two to two and a half litres of vodka a day. Two to two and a half litres? Yep. That's from How the much have you drunk today, then, for instance, do you know? About two and a half litres of vodka. So how... But that's from when I wake up, which could be six o'clock in the morning right through until I go to sleep. But it's not a binge drink. It's just... Continuous? Yep. And where do you find the money to, 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 to buy your drugs and to buy that kind of amount of alcohol? If, you do, if you're going for that amount of alcohol, that's a lot of money a week, isn't it? Friends and family. Where are you living now? Homeless. So where are you sleeping tonight? I can show you where I'm sleeping if you want. Dave was happily married for 17 years and has two children. But since leaving the army and the breakdown of his marriage, he spent time in hostels and sleeping rough on the streets. See the scaffold? The actual scaffold? You think how big that beam was? I could get up there and two seconds flat. Not a better drink. Skippering is slang for sleeping rough. Are you, are you skip on in there, eh? No, we... I don't know. Under bridges, this is what we need to do. That's life in Glasgow. I mean, I know I'm getting nothing there, we are, know what I mean? Our stamps have been put on their heads now in this town now. Don't give him any money, don't walk near them, you know what I mean? It's like They're drinkers or drug users, you know what I mean? They're not all bad people. It's, like... it's nothing to be proud of, but I'd rather be in a jail where I know I'm safe. I've got a telly now, I've got three square meals a day. See, and I can a... just lie myself. Don't need to be paranoid about walk about a tune. <laughs> You have to wonder how dangerous the streets are if someone is prepared to, to risk life and limb and climb 30 feet up to sleep safely under a railway bridge. And if prison is a better option and people are prepared to commit crime to get there, what's that costing us, not only as taxpayers, but also as a society? After our interview, Dave spent weeks in a coma following a confrontation on the streets. You're 13 times more likely to be a victim of violence if you're homeless. Nearly 30% of the homeless population is female. Gillian has been homeless for six years. So you tell me how you, you, you first became a prostitute. What happened there? I was using heroin. I ended up using heroin through a relative sex partner who was injecting me with heroin. What? He was just injecting you? Well, you must have, did you not want to be injected? I was nine. You were nine years old? Nine years of age. He started injecting me with heroin. I had to keep that for my family. I kept that for why, my family. Why was somebody injecting you with heroin when you were nine years old? To abuse me. At nine years old? He told me I was diabetic. He told you you were diabetic? He was injecting me with heroin to tell me that it was insulin. And did you not have your parents not around at the time to say they weren't there? They were around, but I was staying with, as I said, a relative. And, and that, one of those relatives was doing that too? Yeah. 
how did you get out of that situation, or didn't you? What happened? How did that cycle stop? When I found out I was pregnant, I told the relative I've seen me, and... So, hang on, you probably couldn't have got pregnant when you were nine, so when no, I was pregnant... No, pregnant at 17. Pregnant at 17. So that went on, that abuse went on for that many years? Yeah. I wanted to go to school, I wanted to learn, I wanted to do things that normal people do. I wanted to get an education, but I had to make sure that I had this fixed to make sure that I could get up and do it all. And are you, you still a user of heroin? I've just started back using heroin again. Yeah, really? How long ago? Just three weeks ago, I had a miscarriage. Yeah. And used the heroin to try and block it out. All right, so tonight, what would be the normal routine for you tonight? What, cause... Work here, do what I can, and then as long as I've got at least 100, 150 a night, that's how long I've stayed. 150 mm -hmm. quid, yeah? Mm -hmm. That three or four um, clients. And then what will you do with that money? Go and buy hair on, make sure that my partner's all right, clean clothes. And... But just the practicalities of you living rough, as it were, yeah. what about getting, getting warm? How, how much sleep do you get? Very, very little. Very little. It's, I worked it, I thought it was about four days that I've been up, but it's not, it's about a week. You've actually not slept properly um, at all? At all. For a week? For a week, mm-hmm. I mean, how come can you survive for it? If you've not slept in a week... If I've got a habit, I'm going to have to do it. I need to keep myself my toes, cos there's no way I'm going to sit down and... As I said, I've just no... I've still got some pride. I need to know that I'm going away and closing the door and going to sleep. Mm. I'd rather walk the streets. I've got to have somewhere that I can just go and do what I'm doing. See the skipper that I had? Mm, the place you were sleeping. I've yeah. got keys to that and I've locked it up. Well, we can go down and I can show you exactly where it is. And can we do that? Yeah, we can do that any time you like. Uh -huh. Can we do that now? Just your foot and just be careful because it's a bad there. You're better at doing this than I. <laughs> so this is where you were, yeah? This is where we were, yeah. Brand new bed and we had this double bed here. Gillian and her boyfriend have spent the last six months skippering under a road bridge. Last night, moneylenders chasing payment from another couple set fire to their skipper. You must, did you not sometimes think, you know, how did I get here? I mean, you're going to be seen doing this film, mm -hmm. yeah? What, what do you think your, your parents will think about that? They'll be amused, but me and my mother don't go in there now. We're just too alike, and it's just, it's been an ongoing thing for years. I wouldn't embarrass my mother waking up like this. She knows what I do. She knows that I'm on heroin. So I'm not going to exactly embarrass her by turning up in the door and asking for some work to stay. Mm. I wouldn't do it. I'd rather just walk the streets. You've got kids of your own, haven't you? Mm -hmm. I'm going to get girls, yeah. They're at my mother's. As long as I know my mother's looking after them well. And I can't expect to could drag kids for pillar to post. Couldn't live with them here, could you? No. And, you, and there's no way of you reconciling the differences with your mum? No. No. Just been too Even long. for the kids? Been too long. What I find fascinating about the parallel worlds that exist in this country when it comes to poverty is, you know, just round the corner, there are these very expensive flats uh, very nice cars, and you know what? I've got a nice car, relatively nice car, and, and I live in a relatively nice house. But it's about this parallel that I'm discovering that exists in this city and across the UK of, of people who live in poverty and people who don't, and how these two worlds seem to be going they're paralleled, and they're not crossing very often because you can live there and have no idea, not an iota, that there were people living just there in, you know, as, as cave people, basically. 
people should not be living like that when there are other people living like that. And I know I'm one of them. And I think I'm as guilty as anybody else of turning a blind eye to the poverty in this country. I'm out delivering sandwiches to some of the hostels for the homeless in Glasgow with Martin, a volunteer from the Salt and Light charity. There is a lot of rejuvenation going on here, isn't there? I mean, yeah. money is being spent. Yeah. Oh, aye, definitely. But why is why is this why is this city still got such a problem then with homeless people? Why has it got such a problem with prostitution and drug abuse? It's a hard one to answer. I think the. I think some of the problem is that some of the guys and girls have their own problems, their own demons. And it's, it's, it's no, uh, you can't just stick a plaster on it and, you know, there's no one easy solution. Glasgow was once the second city of the British Empire. But in the 1970s, like many cities in the UK, industry went into decline. And to deal with the growing numbers of unemployed and homeless, hostels were built. But here in Glasgow, with the explosion of drugs in the mid-80s, many hostels became hotbeds for drug abuse and crime. Today, the council-run hostels have been shut down, and the council now helps fund the private and charitable ones. So let's just clear one thing up then, right? What I've just witnessed, there is supposed to be no alcohol and no drugs in a hostel, right? I've just witnessed people drinking Buckfast, which is a fortified wine with caffeine in it, and I've just witnessed people smoking heroin, and they came directly out of a hostel. To get a better understanding of what it's like living in a hostel, I've been granted access to Kingston Halls. We're on our way to a hostel run by the Talbot Centre. It's home to around 61 guys, many of whom are waiting for council housing, some of whom just simply have nowhere else to go. Kingston Halls is one of seven residential projects run by the Talbot Association, a charity set up in the 70s to meet the high levels of homelessness in Glasgow. Debbie, the manager, explains that Kingston Halls is considered to be one of the better hostels around and consequently has to turn people away on a regular basis. So this is just one of the rooms? This is, this room. is one of the rooms. This is Scott? Yeah, this is his room. And how long has he been here, do you know? Oh, about three, four months. So he's got a TV, bed. So they have a bathroom that they can use, yeah? yeah? Every time they want a laundry done, they just come down, put their name down in the book so you can have a laundry done. Their rooms are cleaned, the bedding's cleaned once a week, but their clothing can be done... Whatever they want. But but some so they're, not, they're outfits, not responsible, they're not responsible for cleaning their own... Well, we encourage them to keep their environment clean and tidy, um, but the domestic staff come in and make sure that it's up to standard. This is part of the refurbishment that I was telling you about earlier. Yeah. These rooms used to be two to a room. But a lot of these guys, let's be fair, a lot of them have been, um, been to prison, haven't they? A lot, of them. a lot of guys have been to prison. So they're used to Yeah, a lot of guys come through the care system. So this is... Oh, my God, this is very good. Yeah. Isn't it? This guy looks like he's <laughs> ex-forces by the looks yeah. of it. I have stayed in worse hotels than this <laughs> around well, the world. Thank I mean, you. Uh, really, yeah, but, it's, but it's fantastic. And mm -hmm. this guy, clearly, whoever he may be, mm -hmm. he takes very much yeah, pride, pride in, in his, his room. He's pride in his room and his appearance, by the looks of it. He's, he's uh, far more tidy than I am. Yes, and me. How long can someone stay here, Debbie? It's not indefinite. Is this a stopgap, then? This is, yeah, this is a stopgap. But some people, once they're out of the, what we would call a caring environment mm -hmm. in terms of having you guys should something go wrong or someone to clean i mean literally they do get their rooms clean for them as well yes, they do. is there not is there not the risk that 
that by caring for them so much that they become so reliant that going out into the world is so daunting that you don't want to leave an environment like this? Uh, to some point, I, I do agree. However, not everybody here goes to a house yeah. and is set up to fail. You know, this is, as you said, a stopgap. You know, and we're here to make the stopgap that wee bit more comfortable. To help with the high demand, there is a makeshift area where 10 men can bed down for the night. And is there a typical person that comes here? Is it somebody that's just freshly walked out of a house or been kicked out of a house? Or could it be someone that's been long-term, you know, living out on the streets? All of them. All of the above, yeah? Mm -hmm. Can be any of those issues. Yep. And some of them can be well known to you, yeah? Yep, yep. It could have been people, in fact, that have stayed here before, yeah? There are, yes, indeed, there are. One returning ex-resident is 37-year-old John, who is addicted to Valium. And how much Valium are you taking? About 30 a day. 30 yeah. a day. What, what sometimes, strength? Sometimes more. What, what strength were they? 10 blue, blues, 10 mils. 10 milligrams? Yeah. You're taking 30 of those? Easy. Mm -hmm. That's 300 milligrams of Valium? Easy. It's amazing what a habit can do to you. You know what I mean? Right. And did you work at that? We couldn't no, work no, with 300 no, milligrams no, of Valium inside Because you. I spent so much, many years in prison, you know what I mean? That oh, right. Any trades that I do know, I've learned in prison. So right. coming out to do it here, it's like going to a job interview and saying, oh, I, I know how to do this, but I learned my trade in prison. Straight away they're going to say, well... You don't get a job, right? You're not going to get a job. So how much time, if you add it up, if you think you've been inside prison? Oh... You're talking about maybe about 12, 13 years. So what about the future for you, John? Well, basically, I've had this question asked to me so many times because of me, I've been living basically on the street since I was 12. Right? I mean, so it's a long time. And, uh, since you were 12, you've been I, living out on the streets? Since I left my child, I was putting a children's home and I ran away. From then, I've only ever lived on the streets, in prison or in hostels. So that's a long time, you know what I mean? Also, you're in a cycle that's very hard to break, isn't you? Uh, it's not easy. It's, like, it's, it's, it's a habit of its own. It's, it's, going to be, it's going to take a lot, you know what I mean, for me to get to be in a normal life because I've got a lot of hurdles to climb. There's clearly a pattern emerging here of people going from prison on the streets to hostels. And you have to question if enough being done to get people to stand up on their own two feet and take responsibility for themselves, or is it just too easy for them to remain in that cycle? Fraser is a hostile resident who explains to me why presently it's not in his interest to get out of the benefit system. It's £165 a week, regardless. All right. Um, the housing benefit will cover £137 and the rest you have to make up out of your fortnightly money. Your you, you, you gyro. Yeah, but if, I was, if I was earning minimum wage and working 40 hours a week, they would still expect 165 quid a week. Which would leave you very little. Which would leave me with, what's the point in working? By the time I've travelled to work, fed myself for lunch during the day, I'd actually be in debt. So, I mean, the system's built up so that you have to be unemployed. And then you've still got to justify to the job seekers allowance that you're out there looking for work or they'll stop your money. Just so you can stand And I'm having to put on my CV that I've been in prison. And if I want a job, I never tell people I've been in prison because you just won't get the job. So I'm, I'm applying for these jobs that I might get because the job centre are sending me the referrals and I'm having to apply for them. But on the bottom of my CV, I'm writing down that I was in prison for nine months just to make sure I don't, don't get, get the, the job, job so I can continue getting my benefits so that I can get a flat sooner or later. It's, uh, aye, the system's broken. I need to get out and earn my own money so that I can feel good, you know? Because there's nothing better than when you go to the bank at the end of the week and you take out money that hasn't been given to you by the government. You've grafted for it, it's yours, and if you want to go for a pint, go for a pint, you deserve it. Yeah, it's your money. And it'll taste a lot much better and as well. And it does. You know, nothing quite like a, a nice tall glass of lager at the end of the day when you've worked hard and you're paying for it. I mean, it's really nice if somebody else is buying it, but, you know. yeah. It's clearly wrong that a system intended to get people back to work is preventing Fraser from doing so. And it also highlights that the system is open to manipulation. 
And if the gap between the money that you earn by working and by not working is so small, then why would you work? The benefit system was set up as a, a safety net to help people back to work, not for people to adopt it as a way of life. But no matter how much support is offered, there will always be those who fall through the cracks. You pulled, you pulled your own toes off. Aye. Britain is the founding father of the welfare state. In the 1940s, Lord Beveridge came up with a system to eradicate what he called the giant evils. Squalor, ignorance, want, disease and idleness. Today, the British government spends over a hundred billion pounds on welfare. That's one sixth of its entire budget spent on benefits. Traveling around the world, I, I have witnessed uh, poverty in, in Africa, in South America, in certain parts of the United States. Um, and the poverty here is different. Um, and for many of the people I've met around the world, uh, they were born into it, and for economic reasons, there is clearly no way out for them. You know, probably watching this film, you're asking why of the people that I've met not got out of the situation that they're in, you know? You know, there, there are people willing to help them. But the fact is, if they can't see a way out themselves, then they're never going to get out of the cycle that they're in. To try to break this cycle of poverty, Glasgow is demolishing its old housing schemes and trying to revive communities. We're in Hamilton Hill. We're um, about to go and meet one of the few residents that's still remaining in these, in these what were tenements. And they're actually pulling all of these down. Uh, we spoke to Postman just now. He guesses there are around about 50 people still living here, and we're going to meet one of them, a man called Neil. Neil, hey. how are you? Good to meet you, mate. How are you? Hi. Come in, yeah? Hi. Come on. Right, a bit. This is your kitchen, yeah? Hey, it's called, yeah. Hey. How long have you been here? Five, six years. Do you ever use it to use it to cook? Aye. Well, yeah, yeah. have you ever seen the, the cooker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've not done the dishes yet. Have you, what, have you got, what have you got in your fridge right now? <laughs> I can tell you what see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing. No. Someone said, please clean microwave. I have my sister, but I don't know what what's, what's, what's in this? What's this here? That's, that's flour to put chips in. Yeah, right. OK, you got that there, to put your chips in, right. There's a heart condition, or oh, three heart attacks. I've got my toes took off. I've got psoriasis in my stomach. So yeah. you've had three heart attacks, you've got psoriasis, and you've had your toes? Took off, five of my toes. So just... You pulled, to... you pulled your own toes off? Aye. That's it. I was not blood on that because of this. It was just pure black, pure bogging. So you just snapped them off, eh? Aye. So I did, snapped them off. I mean, what are you, what are you living off? What are you eating? Well, I usually buy sausages. I put four, a pound for 14 sausages, buy a couple of them, hamburgers, two pounds for 20, loaves. Two it. pound for 20. Aye. I have to go to you know, Iceland and you know, literally I can hardly walk or nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm going to be doing there. How old are you now? 46. You're 46. Right, it's in my living room. So I'm going to walk away because my knees, it's killing me. Your knee's killing you, yeah? Aye. When you ha you've, had, you've had three heart attacks, you say. You've got cirrhosis of the liver. Aye. And you've... you've, you've five toes. You've, got, you've pulled your five toes off, yeah? Aye. What did you do with them? I, I, I took them on top, top of the telly. Sorry? Two of them on top of the telly. Two of them were on top of the telly? Aye, yeah. Uh, that's a big toe, man. I think it's a wee toe. It's all right, let's have a look. That's my that's, toe. That, that's your toe? That's my toe, eh? I've got to see the bone, yeah. That's it. So I have to test them off. So you can see the nail there, can't you, and the bone that was behind it? You just broke them off, yeah? Aye, there's an old wine line a bit somewhere. 
Do you not think that was probably not a very good idea, really? No, because one nurse was telling him we're going to pull up anyway, and there was so much pain I was in. So I just, just got drunk and just went, here it goes. And you just, pulled your toes uh, off? and just came off. Yeah. You feel better now, yeah, sitting down? But that's what, that's what I do. Have you got a son or daughter or anything? I've got a son. Yeah. But he drinks a lot and all. He drinks a lot. He's, yeah. he's staying with his ma. He's staying with his ma, yeah. She doesn't obviously have anything to do with you anymore. Oh, she, oh she's just woof, no. Uh, she, she used to jail me all the time. She's what, sorry? She used to jail me all the time. She used to put you in prison, yeah? Aye, uh, well, even, even when I never done nothing. So how much time did you serve inside? Oh, four months here, four months here, 30 days here, 60 days here, 30 days here. Three months here. And what was generally the offence that you were jailed for? Domestic violence. Oh, right. Did you sleep? Did you sleep well? No. Yeah, these. I was like, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all badly bruised. How much money do you actually get a week? It's seventy. Seventy quite a week. And what does that go on if you're buying burgers? It's not, I tell you, goes and booze, is it? I mostly booze drink. Yeah. Uh, birds, horses, don't want the horses. That's my skin. I just go back to the hamburgers, beans, sausages, and all that. It's not that I want to eat that. It's just that I've got to eat that. But a lot of people would say, you know, if you're spending that money on alcohol and you're spending that money on the horses, you know, you should be actually be spending that money on some decent food, well, not 20 burgers. Actually, if you think for about it, yeah, two pounds. But if you've been on that drink for that, that many years, you can't, you can't change, and if you change that, you die straight away. Yeah. Neil, did you ever have a job? Did you ever work? No. Well, as I said, I was a terror away when I was a youngster. You were a terror away? Aye. So I was in, in jail then, I was 16 no, no. So what do you think is your future now, looking at where you are now when, and your health? I think to the end of this year. Say that again? To the end of this year. To the end of this year? That's what I think, and we're lifted. All right, we came, we came to see you today. How often does somebody come and see you? Nobody <laughs> comes up and sees you, you just sit here. Pure bored. Just hope. Hope, mum, hope that somebody comes up. And they don't, they don't. The way it goes, the way I see you. I feel that no one really should be living like that. I mean, he. He said, you know, we were the first people that he'd really spoke to in a week, and if anybody does come to see him, they knock, see if he's, he's OK, and then leave. I mean, they didn't even go into, the, go into the flat. He says, can you blame them? And I have to say, no, not really. Um, he, as he said, he's, he's just waiting to die. Um, and uh, there may be people watching this programme that have judged him and said, you know, he... he, you know, he that man has got what he deserves, you know. He's, he's ended up where he deserves to be. I personally think that no one in this day and age should be living like that. I'm about to discover a new initiative that's helping the homeless and having a real impact. I've tried everything, everything I've tried, and this is the only thing that's ever worked to me. And I received some news from Gillian. My head's everywhere, it's just, a, this is a lot to take in. One of the initiatives implemented by Glasgow Council, which is having a positive effect, here is supported accommodation. Many homeless people find it difficult to break the cycle of living on the streets, living in hostels or ending up in prison. The aim of supported accommodation is to help the homeless re-enter and become valued members of society. William, John and Ross are all in supported accommodation and have agreed to show me some of their old haunts. So where are we walking now, guys? This is us just going down the back to Spring Road Shopping Centre. Until recently, these young men bounced between jail, hostels and the streets and were taking and selling drugs. I had a job as a van boy right for evening times. I remember my, my pa 
I was just selling a lot of drugs in Mary Hill. Uh, and I come up and they were like, no, about it, because I used to make like hundred pound a week or something as a van boy. Uh, and I could make triple that in a day. So I ended up finishing my job. I gave my job as a van boy to go and sell drugs. So I could have money and stuff need... like that. So you're making three times what you'd make doing deliveries for and the And a full week, I could do that within that day, no bother. And I had in a day, and I had all the drugs that I wanted. So yeah. it made perfect sense to go and sell drugs. <laughs> no, at the time, that's... How old that's were you then, then? 16. 16, what time did you start? How old were you when you started selling? When I started selling, yeah. um, say about 12, 13. 12, but mad, 13. Years of age, but my actually started. 13. Uh huh. It started a way before then. I always looked up to the older ones, and it was my big brother and things like that. So they were all smoking the hash. So to be, feel, be part of, I wanted to do that. And with the drugs came violence. I'd get my hand shaved. That is uh, uh, that's a good scar. Uh, I'd get my hand shaved and get my. A scar right down the back. Are you really top of your aiming? Aye, no. Was that, what was that with him? Uh, that was with a Rambo knife. The guy attacked his way and three of them attacked his with Bally Clavers and that. I got stabbed in the rectum and ended up with a cost in my bag for a year as well. That was on the wana. That just, I was left for deep. William, John and Ross were brought up in some of the toughest areas of Glasgow. So we're going to Merry Hill, yeah? Yep. Was it ever merry? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it was merry you... in several weekends, aye. He was merry on several weekends, was it? <laughs> many a weekend. I grew up in Hull. Yeah. My uncles had a big influence, so they did cheer it. Because I was young and stuff like that, and I never had much and stuff like that. I, I remember they'd done a robbery, they'd done a post office, and ended up in jail. I, I remember being young, growing up, and thinking, I want to, I want to rob a post office. It made a lot you of money. You want to drive a post office? I want to, aye, I wanted to be with them. See, that way, when they sell drugs and had lots of money and nice cars and nice girlfriends, and when they looked on the outside, their life looked good. Selling drugs, having girls, having money in your pocket, it's yep. all, it's all, it's, it, it, it just appears no, glamorous, so doesn't it? But the reality, is it that glamorous? No, it's not. But well, I have to say, to the untrained eye, that doesn't look, doesn't look bad to me. Well, they're just all new hussies. It used to be all tenements. Yeah. See, the thing is, they look good on the outside, but it's the same people that's inside them. Ross, Aye. it's just like addiction. You can dress it up on the outside, but it's the yep. inside you've got to work on. Isn't it, Ross? Yep, yep. exactly. Uh -huh. If you were put back, say, over there tomorrow, Ross, do you reckon you'd go back to drugs? See, see the day? I don't think I would. See the day? I've got a lot of good friends in my life. I've got a lot of good support in my corner. A lot, I see, I see a big difference. See me past, see when it was going on for me. I would use dog to suppress my feelings. See two days before Christmas, my wee mum passed away. So Sorry. she did. My wee mum passed away and it was, it was like, crushed me. But I didn't need to run away and use drugs. I had people like John and Molly hooing about me to talk to, you know, and, and to, Give, encourage me and pick me up and you no know, and pull me through it and support me and you no know, just to be there for me. What a lovely day, boys. Yeah. yeah. I'd seen the summers, I used to walk with Berkus, he's on man. Fucking okay, pure. You know what I mean? Hood up and all that. Fucking the game, the eye contact and all yeah. that. Really? Right. Seen you get clean walk through Glasgow, you end up mm. noticing buildings and all that you've never, 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 never been there for that. years or not. <laughs> I'm not gonna put an addiction in your eyes, yeah, basically. Can I deal with people with their trainers? Because <laughs> 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 you're people by their trainers, isn't it? Because you're each spin that, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 is better than anything else that's out there. It learns you to how to deal with life, how to move into your own tenancy. But it doesn't throw you skills. directly out there on no, your own. No. It's a stepping stone. And you've got, a, you've got a key worker in a supported accommodation, which is really, is really important, I think, because you can go down and you can share your, your, your stuff, see you just eating. And they sort of keep them tappy as well, and you need to get in there and let them know yeah. how, how you're doing, what's happening in your life. And when they get that, if you were in a, a, a hostel, but you know.
William Hunter House, run by the Salvation Army, not only treats the lads for their addiction, but also teaches them basic living skills so that eventually they'll be able to have a home of their own. How long would you be in supported accommodation before they would consider you OK to go out? You can take you 12 months, it can take you 18 months, it can take you up to two years. I've not really heard anybody further than two years. It all depends how much work you're putting into it. See if I'm putting a lot of effort in and a lot of work in it, I could leave after six months if I feel I'm ready. It's done to the individual. Supported accommodation has seen a 68% decrease in repeat homelessness. Right. And here's just uh, your wee sitting room, your living room, two, two wee couches. Uh, this is sort of oh. my entire in that. Uh, your own comfort, you can just come up here and just left to your own devices. And you get in there, that's your wee kitchen. And uh, you get your fridge and you get your cooker. Realistically, William, are you going to get something like this when you leave here? I, I should get something better than this, to be right. quite honest with you. Really? She, yeah. she said that she, uh, you well, you have a house. house, they've got a good uh, rapport. Good See, with the housing association. for so. getting you a, a place where it suits you. Yep. Everything you encountered before this hasn't worked? Nothing. Nope. As, as I said to you earlier on, I've been in different treatment centres, detox centres, been in hostels, I've been in the jails. I've tried everything. Everything I've tried, and this is the only thing that's ever worked to me, and it's it's still working today, you know what I mean? Yep. It's the longest I've been clean my life. It's the most self-worth and self-belief and self I you know, I just... I've got faith in there. No, if I just keep doing what I'm doing, everything's going to be all right. Guys, you've been absolutely really impressive today, and you've uh, you've got a convert in me. So cool. thank you very much. Eh? Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you. Josh. Thank the reasons for poverty and people being trapped in the cycle of poverty are far more complex than I first imagined. Uh, clearly, there are aspects of the welfare system that need to be reassessed and the system will always be open to manipulation and there will always be some that fall through the cracks. But for all its faults, I have to say I think it's something to be incredibly proud of because the lives that is changed for the better are unquantifiable. Before I leave, I get some news. After six years of being homeless, Gillian has been given a flat by the Housing Association. Oh, before you go through, how do you feel? Nervous, I'm shaking. Sure? <laughs> You're shaking? What does it mean to you? Nothing. There you go. It's pretty good, isn't it? And it's got actually a sofa in it. <laughs> the decorated looks really, really good, yeah. huh? Have a look yeah. and see where my kitchen is. I don't even Your know kitchen. what that is. <laughs> Fridge, cooker. Be able to cook my first meal. <laughs> Washing machine. Everything. Oh, God. <laughs> It's not even a choice for me. Meth don't get myself sorted. Definitely. I'm not losing this. Mm -mm. It's took me long enough to get here. Definitely. And what about your family now, you know, the kids? What about maybe having them over in a period of time? I need to speak to my mother. And in time, hopefully. In time. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. You're going to have to do... Me and my mother are so alike, and they've never seen eye to eye, but I love her for looking after my kids. With her, her. My kids could have been in the system. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. My 
heads up to it. It's just the, this is a load to take in. <laughs> just can't believe I'm actually here. <laughs> Well, we witnessed a momentous day in Julian's life. You rarely see things that make you that happy in life when you see somebody whose life has been pushed and she's been hurt and she's been trampled on. And now she has a chance to turn her life around. And I hope, I honestly hope, that she achieves that.